Hello, uh, welcome to another one of APSA's interactive sessions of the 2021-2022 academic year. We are very pleased to host tonight's sessions uh, with current students to answer general questions about post back and gap year programs. Uh, I'd like to now go ahead and introduce our wonderful panelists, uh, including their current institutions, as well as what they did during their gap years. To be efficient, I'll call on you by your name. So, can we first have Kelly Borges? Sure, yeah. Thank you guys for having me. Um, my name is Kelly Borges. I went to the University of Connecticut for undergrad. I graduated in 2015 with a bachelor's in physiology and neurobiology. And right after college, I started working as a clinical research coordinator at uh, the University of Pennsylvania. And I also did a master's program while I was there in bioethics. And now I'm currently a second year student in a DO PhD program at the New York Institute of Technology. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, next we have Deanna Lisa Jones. Hi, I'm Deanna Lisa. Um, I'm a fourth year MD PhD student at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, which is in New York City currently. Um, I went to undergrad at Columbia University where I got a bachelor's in biomedical engineering and then I took three gap years between um, college and starting medical school. So during that time, I did the NIH sponsored post baccalaureate research education program or prep at Mount Sinai for two years. And then I did another year that was supported by an NIH diversity supplement. So I'm happy to discuss any of that. Awesome. Thank you, Deanna. Um, next is Amara Peng. I think you're muted right now. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Amara. Um, I graduated from UCLA in 2018 and I majored in microbiology and genetics with a minor in biomedical research. Um, I actually took three gap years and worked as a research assistant in the same lab that I was in as an undergrad because I wanted to keep working on the project and just get a bit more of that experience um, of longevity on working on something. Um, and then now I'm a first year medical student at OHSU. Thank you, Mara. Next we have Daniel, Danielle Sawyer. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Danielle Sawyer. I'm a third year MD PhD student at the University of Arizona College of Medicine in Tucson, Arizona. And um, I graduated from UC Davis in um, 2017. My major was in cellular biology. Um, I took two gap years um, before uh, matriculating into the MD PhD program in which I was a research assistant also in the same uh, lab that I worked in for my undergrad. And um, I also worked as a medical scribe in a medical oncology office. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, next is Cynthia Tang. Hi, everyone. I'm Cynthia. I am a fourth year MD PhD student at the University of Missouri. So I'm a second year graduate student. Um, I graduated from the College of Idaho in 2015, and I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. So I did a one-year post back research program at Washington University McDonald Genome Institute, um, and I can link that program in the chat box later. Um, at, but after that, I realized that I did not enjoy bench work, but I did want to work more directly with patients. So I, um, similar to Kelly, I also became a research coordinator, a clinical research coordinator at the WashU Department of Anesthesiology. Um, I learned to consent patients, I wrote IRBs and managed clinical studies, and I loved it. And I did that for two years. Um, and that's been really valuable in med school and grad school as well. So I learned that I enjoyed clinical research and I enjoyed working with patients. So I joined the MD PhD program in bioinformatics at the University of Missouri. Awesome. Thank you, Cynthia. Last, we have Anne Mary Wells. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, I graduated from Rice University in 2016. Um, I'd had a major in Latin American studies, which humanities major, um, decided to take a couple of years. So I took four total gap years. I took two years to get some more work experience. Um, and I was also interested in education. So I was a full-time teacher. Um, I then decided that medicine was really it. And so I went to get a master's degree from Boston University. I was in the MAMS program. If you've heard of that, I can link it also in the chat. Um, my focus for my uh, master's was neuroanatomy and neurodevelopment, and now I'm a second year 
a medical student at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio, Texas, and my research is largely focused on what my master's was also. Thank you so much for your introduction. Uh, we're grateful that all of you took the time out of your day to come to this virtual event to provide your wisdom to the folks thinking about you know, what to do during their gap years. I know this is a very important step and this is a step that where um, your applications are really sharpened and strengthened. And so my name is Jeff and I'll be your moderator for the evening. I am a first year MD PhD student at the University of Illinois College of Medicine. And the chat box also helping us moderate will be Anna Kolsad and Eli Wisdom. And our volunteer live uh, and our volunteer live tweeting the event will be Lin Pham. Uh, for those of you who are going to step away or miss a piece of this meeting, as a reminder, we will be recording this event. Um, as a moderator, I remind you to please submit your questions to the Q&A box below. Uh, you can see that in the, uh, the Zoom tab below. And uh, we have a team of co-moderators behind the scenes that is uh, collecting the questions live. Uh, you can submit the questions in the chat box. Uh, so I think as that's all the announcements that I have. So thank you again for all of you being here. And I'm going to go ahead and start with our first question. Uh, this is directed to everyone. Um, what did you do during your gap years and how did you find these opportunities? Uh, we can go ahead and start with Kelly. Sure, yeah. So um, <laughs> I don't know if I'm representative of the group, but I didn't really consider them as gap years. Uh, because I had no intention of going to medical school initially. I just graduated from undergrad and didn't really have a plan. I knew I was interested in research because I did some undergrad research. Um, so I was actually really interested in exercise physiology, but uh, reality kind of hit and I needed to get a job. And so I applied to a bunch of jobs. I moved to Philadelphia because my best friend was going to dental school there at the time. And um, thought it would be a good idea. So it actually took a while to get a job. So that's that's a heads up for uh, anyone who thinks it might be easy. But I was really fortunate to find to find a job at the University of Pennsylvania in, in clinical research, really fell in love with the patient care environment. Um, and fortunately, I had done, I think, the majority of the, the recommended classes for applying to medical school. So my master's degree wasn't uh, wasn't a medical postdoc. It was medically related, being bioethics, but it was really for enjoyment and also because my job paid for it. So uh, <laughs> it was it was a good opportunity. But yeah, that's what that's what actually made me interested in going to medical school was my position working as a clinical research coordinator. Great. Um, next, we have Deanna Lisa. Hi, so like I said, I did the post-baccalaureate research education program or PREP at Mount Sinai. So it's actually, a, it's an NIH program, which I can also put the link in the chat too, but they have it, it's sponsored by NIH, but they have it at maybe like 30 or 40 different medical schools across the country. Um, and so the the premise basically, it's, it's a post-bac program, but it's not a typical post-bac where you are just taking uh, like pre-med courses, for example. What you do is that you work in a, a research lab full time for one or two years, and then you're able to take graduate school classes generally just to demonstrate maybe if you like want to show like, oh, my GPA was maybe not as stellar as I would want it to be, um, but I want to demonstrate that I can handle this like graduate level courses. You're able to do that. Um, our, our program also offered some support studying for the MCAT as well. So you really get to like, for me, it was the first time I got to do research full time because when I was in college, it was difficult um, I had to like, you know, work and also be in school and things like that. So um, I actually found out about it like very coincidentally. So I really wanted to make sure that I pushed prep during this session so that everyone could know about it. Um, because I, I did a summer research program at Baylor um, College of Medicine in Houston and the, the summer research program director was also the prep director at Baylor. And so she, she kind of like suggested like, oh, maybe this is something that that you could do. So I, I just had heard about it from her and I hadn't heard about it anywhere else. Great, that's pretty neat. Um, next, Amara. Um, yeah, so for mine, 
um, it was kind of a planned transition. So I had already talked to my like PI at the time about like staying on and working with a specific postdoc. So I think starting that conversation early is very helpful if you're interested in staying in your undergraduate research lab. I personally wanted a job for my gap years because I needed to work because my parents um, weren't helping me anymore. So that was also a big push for staying in the lab was um, that it was gonna be a job, but also like staying with my PI and him knowing that I was interested in MD PhD programs made it a great um, kind of fit because I was able to like attend conferences and you know he kind of treated me some, somewhat pseudo prep, but with like without having all like the commitments of being like in an official post back program. So that was kind of my path during my gap years. See, um, Daniel. Yeah, and um, so I took two gap years and and. Um, I kind of had to, to take them just because of the nature of um, the way that I went through school. Um, I went to community college prior to transferring to UC Davis. And I don't think that there was really good education out there, um, especially for um, first generation college students on um, when you should take your MCAT. And so for me, once I transferred, I was already you know approaching or going into my junior year. And um, it just really, you know, was a whole adjustment process. And so I decided to take at least one gap year. I ended up taking two and I took the MCAT after graduation. So that was the main purpose of me um, kind of taking that time. Um, but during my, my gap year time, I continued to work um, in the research lab at UC Davis that I had worked at um, for part of my undergrad. Um, and then I also really wanted to gain clinical experience and really like confirm with myself that I wanted to not just pursue a PhD, but really, I was really passionate about, um, you know, working with patients and long hours in the clinic and all of that. And I think being a medical scribe was a really, really good way to see um, absolutely all of the ins and outs of the way that physicians think about problems, the way that they approach problems, and to learn um, a little bit about uh, writing medical notes, um, which you have to do a lot in medical school, so. Great, thank you. Uh, Cynthia? Yeah, like I said earlier, um, I graduated from college, not really sure about what I wanted to do. And I came from a small liberal arts college. So I had some research experiences there, but I also wanted to see what it was like at a bigger institution. So I did the post -bac program at Wash U. And um, that was basically full-time research. We weren't required to take any classes or anything, um, but we did research and we did journal clubs um, and just kind of a lot of exposure to working at the bench and um, reading literature and processing and presenting, communicating science, which was really valuable. Um, and then when I moved into clinical research, um, that was just looking around for different jobs that would give me more opportunities to work with patients, which is something that I uh, realized was really important to me um, while I was working at the bench. So um, I would recommend like it's been said before, but for post back programs or for research years, look early and there are so many opportunities. There's so much variety of as we've already heard today. So definitely look early and talk to people. Thank you. Lastly, Anne Mary. Yeah, um, I think for me, there's a lot of factors. Um, for me, doing like two years, not like pursuing a post back or anything was mostly a financial decision. Um, I needed to just kind of get my life caught up to schooling before um, I advanced anymore because financial things had already like come in the way like an undergrad. So I just needed to catch up. Um, and then I kind of got the opportunity to be an educator, which is really great. And I, that fire is definitely still in me. And so I wanted to try to find a way to like meld all of my interests of like health um, and also like, uh, like mental health, particularly, and then also education. And medicine and an MD PhD really seemed like the idea for that. Um, so I think also as a humanities major, I really needed to kind of get a little bit more on paper regarding science. And so the MAMS program in particular is um, probably one of the most successful special master's programs. Um, structurally, it's very similar to the NIH program that Deanna Lisa was talking about earlier, um, except that for the first year, 
you take basically literally medical school classes with med students, um, technically in like what's called the old curriculum. Now we have what's called the integrated curriculum, um, but that's that's kind of what our program did. And then for the second year, you do research. Um, so I think for me, it was just an opportunity for all of that to just come together and really solidify itself for my application. Um, I'm so sorry, my dogs <laughs> are like <laughs> fighting. Um, and just kind of like make sure I was like a whole person going into to medical school. Yeah, and well, um, every panelist have their own unique experiences. So if you have any questions unique to their experience, feel free to type any questions on the Q&A box. Um, the next question is directed to Kelly and Deanna Lisa, but um, panelists, if you feel like uh, you wanna answer that question, feel free to chime in. Um, so the question is, how has taking gap years helped you feel more prepared for applying to medical school? So we can start with Kelly. Sure, yeah. Um, so I think there's two different ways you could answer this question. So feeling, uh, I guess, mentally and emotionally ready to go to medical school and knowing that that's the decision you want to make versus actually being ready as far as your academics go and your application and looking impressive to an admissions committee. Uh, taking gap years fulfills both for sure. Um, of course, you can get the academic stuff done in four years during an undergrad. And if you know already that you want to become a physician, scientist, or one or the other going into undergrad, then that's great. You know, you're on a fast track to getting to where you want to be professionally. But for people like myself, and I'm sure a lot of others on the panel who maybe weren't as certain if they wanted to do science or medicine or both or neither, then that time really helps you uh, decide if it's right for you in, I guess, a risk-free setting or cost-free setting. I guess the only cost is opportunity costs, right? You know, instead of going to medical school earlier, you're putting yourself into the real world and figuring it out if it's right for you, if you're working in a clinical setting or in a lab setting. Um, but I think the opportunity cost of uh, not going to medical school first is is well worth it because it's a lot more expensive down the road if you end up going and you're not in a tuition paid position in medical school and then realize down the road that this career was not for you whatsoever. So uh, yeah, I mean, I guess to answer the question, it prepares you both ways. You know, you can get a lot of those academic requirements checked off through these post back programs or doing classes on your own. Uh, taking the MCAT. I took the MCAT also, obviously, since I didn't know I wanted to go to med school and undergrad, I took it when I was, I think I had been eight years out of my my first biochem course by the time I had taken the MCAT. Um, but if you're determined and you study hard, you'll you'll do fine. So, so yeah, I, I think the gap time is, is very valuable for both. Definitely agree. Um, just taking that time to really know what you're getting yourself into. I think that's super important during the gap years. Um, Deanna, Lisa, do you have anything to add? Yeah, sure. For me, it was a few things. I think that I was in such a like a much better headspace after having taken some gap years. Uh, so I studied, like I said, biomedical engineering at Columbia, which is a very intense program. And I was super burned out um, after undergrad. And I can I couldn't imagine going straight through. I also hadn't taken the MCAT and um, like started applying because it's kind of you know a lengthy process. You have to apply like during undergrad if you're going to go straight through. Um, so yeah, I, I couldn't have imagined doing that while I was in undergrad. And so I got to kind of like you know enjoy having you know a little bit more free time. Like I got to hang out with my friends more. Like I didn't get to do, I had, I had some income, which I didn't have during undergrad. Um, so I got to kind of just enjoy being in, I lived in New York city. So I got to enjoy doing that um, and spending time with my friends. I think in terms of um, preparing me for, like academically and um, like research wise, I also just, you know, it was the first time that I, like I said, got to do full-time research. So I became a lot more confident in my abilities as a researcher we got to do, you know, journal clubs and grad school courses. So I was able to, you know, feel confident that I wouldn't, um, I would be able to, you know, hang once I got into the MD PhD program. And I also think that, you know, just taking that time, I, uh, I felt like I matured a lot during that time. So if I had tried to go straight through um, and start, 
the MD PhD program when I was 22 and a lot less mature, I think, you know, that would have been very bad. So I'm very glad I took that time to kind of just mature and take care of myself. Um, yeah, and also just develop my my confidence and my uh, my skills as a researcher. Thank you, Diana Lisa. Uh, next question is directed to Amaro and Cynthia. Um, are post back slash graduate research experiences way differently than undergraduate research experiences? So Amaro, you can. Yeah, I can go first. Um... I think that, um, so I started, so I also transferred to UCLA like Danielle. So um, I really figured out that I loved science, especially like basic science, like my senior year of college. So right before, and then this threw off my whole trajectory because at that point it was med school. And then I was like, okay, I really want to, I really want to do this MD PhD program. So I really only had a year of like research um, by the time I graduated UCLA. So although I tried my best to make it super productive, I knew that like a lot of people started research much earlier, right? Like their freshman year. So I knew that like, for me, those gap years are gonna be really important in justifying like my passion for the specific program. So I think that in my um, interviews and in my application, my gap year research experience was very crucial in showing admissions committees that I was like very dedicated to this program and that I really wanted to do it because it showed like, consistency, right, in my training. And also I was able to talk about my undergraduate research project and how it kind of grew into what I was working on now and then ultimately into what was published. So I think that um, in my experience, if you started research a little later and you have this like post undergraduate research experience, it can just add um, onto like, you know, your dedication and your work ethic and you showing the admissions committee that, you know, you're trying your best to get that experience in before you start a program. Cynthia? Yeah, I agree with all of that. Um, I feel like weight is more two sides of it. One is you need to go in knowing what you want to get out of it. And so in undergrad, that can be very different than during your gap years or your research years. Um, because in undergrad, I think admissions committees understand that you are also a student, you might have a different job at the same time um, and you're doing research. And then when you're doing your research years or your gap years, you have a little bit, it's assumed that you have a little bit more time to focus on that. And so you just need to be able to show that you've, you've been producing and learning during that time. I definitely agree. Uh, the next question is for Danielle and Deanne. Uh, Diana Lisa, uh, did you feel any pressure to get it to get published before applying or to work in multiple labs before applying? And do you think these are important to making an application competitive? So we can start with uh, Daniela. Yeah, so um, personally, I didn't feel um, an immense amount of pressure to publish. Um, I think uh, at least you know, from my experience and, um, you know, mentors that I've had, um, you know, I think it's really all about having something that you own, a project that you own, that you, you know, present uh, maybe at conferences, but it's really your own project that you're focused on. And I think that's probably even bigger than like, oh, I published this many, you know, things across, you know, this many different publications, right? Um, so I think that's really crucial and that's really what they're going to probe you for in your interview. Um, and I think as far as um, being a competitive applicant, I, I guess I would say that's probably one of the biggest things. I've worked a lot um, with admissions, both on the MD side and MD PhD side. And um, I think that having a project that you own and then also, you know, there's a little bit of, um, you know, pressure as far as like how long have you worked in this position time-wise. And, you know, the general, the gold standard that everyone throws around is two years, but I always like to um, say, you know, what did you do in those two years? Were you washing dishes or were you actually performing experiments that led to, you know, maybe a figure in someone's paper or, you know, that led to some, some kind of product? Um, and I think that like hours wise, maybe is a little bit more important than, you know, like that two year commitment. Um, 
but yeah, I hope that helps. Yeah, I like, like Danielle said, you really, the most important thing is to be able to, to talk about the work that you've done and to show that, you know, you're invested in it, that you're doing, you know, a lot of the, the thinking and experimental design. And, you know, often you'll be asked, okay, like you had to um, graduate and pass on this project, but what would you like have liked to do next? So just say they want to make sure that um, you can talk about your research and that you, you're thinking critically about it and that you seem passionate. I'm on the admissions committee for the MD PhD program at Mount Sinai. And we have, uh, we always say in all of our meetings, like we always correct people too, if they try to bring up publication, like we do not require publication and we don't penalize anyone for not having publications. Um, that being said, it's like, it's good if you, you know, submitted an abstract to a conference or you presented a poster, um, that's not uh, like the next step would be maybe like a publication, but it just shows that you've like had a chance to kind of put your work together and present it. But we definitely don't require it and we don't penalize anyone for not having publications. Um, and I guess you also asked um, if there's pressure to work in multiple labs before applying. I don't think so. Um, I think um, we have a lot of applicants that, you know, they worked in one lab throughout undergrad and they seemed really passionate about it. And you know they became independent in the lab, and um, that's I think that's sufficient. Um, but actually, I would say that it's come up in our admissions committee meetings a few times. If for people who kind of did a summer in one lab and then did a summer in another lab, sometimes there's they're not penalized for it, but there's concern that you know maybe they haven't had enough like longitudinal experience on a project. Just to chime in, I think um, it's quality over quantity. It doesn't really matter you know, how many labs you rotated in. I think it's better to uh, have one solid research experience. Um, so whether that be you know one or two labs, two or three labs. Um, anyways, next question is directed to Anne. Um, I have a major in Spanish and minor in gender studies and have done research in both a bench lab and in humanities settings. I would really like to continue research in public health setting, but should I focus my attention on more STEM-centered activities during my gap year since my undergraduate path did not focus on that? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I think my path was very similar. So I was Latin American studies um, and that's like a make your own major kind of situation. So my research was very public health, indigenous studies, humanities, so on and so forth. But I also worked in a yeast lab for like all of the years. So I dabbled in everything and did a lot in everything. Um, for me, pursuing research as a component of my master's was more driven because um, I'm really interested in like psychiatric disease. And I, my original approach was through like anthropology and humanities. And um, I realized I'm actually more interested in like the neuroscience aspects and kind of bringing that together. So. Um, I particularly look for research that would boost my neuroscience and bench work um, because I already had a significant experience with humanities. And I think um, for me, I kind of hit the limit for where I could go with that. So um, that's how I decided the balance was right for me. It really just depends on what you're interested in research wise. Um, and it especially matters what kind of MD PhD program you're applying to. Um, I actually applied twice to MD PhD programs, like two different rounds. Um, the first time I applied was medical anthropology, and that didn't go well. Um, so <laughs> I retooled and definitely did science a second time, and that worked very well. Um, it's really just up to you. It, I wouldn't have retooled, though, if I was not interested in neuroscience. So um, I would just be mindful of, like, what kind of PhD you want, and that could maybe help your decision. I think, Cynthia, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I agree with um, Anne, and I think it's really important to pursue what you're interested in. And there are programs that are very humani humanities and social sciences friendly. Um, like for example, so I know some programs are more traditional in the sense that it's more STEM, but there are a lot of programs out there that are open to um, things like public health, epidemiology, statistics, and stuff like that. And so um, it's important to stay true to what you're interested in. And it shows that you're committed to it if you've been doing it from undergrad all the way through 
during your gap years and you're still interested in doing that in medical school and your MD PhD. Um, but I will say that doing more STEM related activities in terms of classes or just learning more about it will help with med school. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, next question is, is it feasible to do a gap year focused on service and volunteer work? And if so, how does that affect the application cycle? I guess it's not really uh, directed towards anyone, but if anyone wants to chime in, feel free to go for it. Totally. I mean, if that's where your heart is at, do it. It's one year. If I mean, if that's what you have in mind, I think it's a great idea. Um, don't do it with the motive of, of the application on your mind, you know, pursue something you're genuinely interested in. If that's service, then so be it. If it's research, then that's what it is. Um, but it's a great way to, you know, find yourself, find what you like, find your passions. Yeah, I, yeah, go oh, ahead. Go ahead, Cynthia. Okay, <laughs> I, I would agree uh, with Kelly that, yeah, if that's something that you're passionate about, you should do it. And like she said, like it's only one year. Um, I think that it wouldn't negatively affect your application as long as you had significant, like significant research experience prior to doing that. Yeah, I just wanted to emphasize, just pursue what you're passionate about, pursue what you're interested in. And especially during your gap years, you have time to do stuff that you didn't get a chance to do and explore back in undergrad. And you might find out that your passion is not in medicine or research, and that's fine. That's just a really good time to figure that out. Um, but definitely follow your passions and doing stuff that isn't just research or just science or classes. It just makes you a much more interesting applicant too. And they'll talk to you about that kind of stuff because they've seen so many applicants that just do research. They have good grades, good scores, good research, and that's everyone. And so um, like I coached figure skating for 10 years and that's most of what they wanted to talk about. So do something interesting, wow. do something a little different um, and they'll remember you for it. Great answers. Uh, to any of the panelists who have experienced this, how do you find post back programs? Do you suggest any resources? So again, this isn't uh, directed to anyone, just feel free to jump in. Um, yeah, I can talk a little bit about my experience. So I think one thing is definitely talk to your mentors, like you can talk to your PI, um, because your PI may always know other people at other institutions that might be looking to hire, like in my experience, a research technician, um, also like your undergraduate research center might be a good place to start. Um, there's people, um, that are, um, I mean, super vested in getting you into a graduate program. And that could be through, like, I heard about prep through this. I heard about like the NIH, um, I think it's the ERACTA program. No, that's a different program. Well, the NIH has another program that you can do like on site. So I think that's a good place to start because like a lot of these, um, you know, faculty at the undergrad re research centers have worked with other alumni in the past. So they have, you know, various places that they have sent students. So I would start there maybe. Are you thinking of Erda, Amara, the NIH program? Yes, I think that's the one, yeah, that you like submit, right, an application and then PIs can, can look at it. Yeah, that one. Yeah, I can put the link to that in the chat too. There's a second part question to this. Um, how can you do a prep program or a similar type of research post back without being from an underrepresented group? For background, I'm a white female from a middle-class family, so I'm not sure if I will be allowed to apply to prep programs. Um, I guess I can answer that one. Yeah, so prep is specifically for people from underrepresented backgrounds. I'm about to put in the chat the link to ERDA, which is also um, an, an NIH post -back program. It's mostly they put you at locations at the NIH um, in Bethesda, in DC area. Um, but yeah, specifically for, for prep programs, it's for people from underrepresented backgrounds. But ERDA is not. Next question is, did you ever receive pushback on your decision to pursue the MD-PhD route 
with a gap year from family for financial reasons and how they should manage it. I think Amara, I think you had an experience with um, um, your family not supporting you during the uh, post back program, I think. You should be able to speak. Um, yeah, no, they're super supportive. It was just, I knew it would be a burden to like go back home and like just have them, you know, kind of take me in again after I'd been gone and worked through college. So I really wanted to just stay on that trajectory of financial independence. Um, but I think that like, there's a lot of programs that have stipends. I believe PrEP has a stipend. Uh, Deanna Lisa is talking about that. Like my job, I, you know, I was getting paid. So there are ways to find post back programs that give you a stipend. Um, and that can be something that you can talk about with your family. Like you going on and taking a gap year doesn't necessarily mean that they're gonna have to like financially support you 100%. Thank you. I think um, Kelly had posted this in the chat, but if you, um, even if you don't get into a post back or any of those programs, if you look for job listings, there's a lot of job listings at different universities for research assistant positions or research tech positions and those will pay. So I, I think most post back programs, um, I guess it depends on which ones you apply to, but most of them will have a stipend. Jobs, of course, will have a stipend or actual pay. Um, and then in the MD-PhD program, most, or DO-PhDs, I think most of those combined programs will also be covered. So you shouldn't have to pay for that. Next question we have is, how did you know you wanted to do an MD-PhD as opposed to MD-MS or MD-MPH? I think this is a great question. Um, I'm sorry, Jeff, did you want to direct that at someone? No, 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 no. These, all these questions are um, open, free for all. So Okay, cool, it. yeah. I mean, um, I guess, the, Madeline, your question is specific to a dual degree. You know, if somebody knows they want to do uh, they want to be both a physician and a scientist. Um, that's one thing. So I guess in choosing which dual degree program you want to do, or what you want to focus your dissertation work or, or what have you on. Um, you typically, I mean, if you're pursuing a program like this, something got you interested in, in science in the first place, right? Or you want to find the answer to something. Um, so look at a bunch of different programs. Don't limit yourself look at all the programs that there are out there and see the faculty at each school, see what type of research they're doing, um, connect with them. You, maybe if it's through a PI you once worked with, or if you've never connected with them before, I'm definitely not opposed to cold emails. Just don't expect a response. Um, if you get one, then that's great, but, but don't expect a response from a cold email. But as far as back to this question of how to decide what program you wanna to go to, I think the gap years really are valuable for making this decision also. And I've gotten this question before too, when it comes to how did you know you wanted to do, to go to medical school versus PA school versus nursing school versus just getting a PhD, right? If you're interested in science and experience in the real world will really tease that out for you, right? So if you're working as a clinical research coordinator, as some of us on the call have, you know, you're in the clinical setting, what about that do you like? And what about that feels satisfying? Is it being able to provide care to a patient? Um, if that's the case, if that's really at the heart of it, then yeah, nursing school might be an option. PA school might be just as a satisfying option. But do you want to direct the care? Do you want to not have to work under supervision um, for whatever reason? You know, Do you wanna lead your own studies as a PI? And then that's when it would be, I think, better to pursue the route of becoming a physician. You don't have to get a PhD or even a master's in science to lead your own research. I worked with plenty of doctors who just had a clinical degree, but, and I might be wrong, um, you might be able to lead studies as a PA. I haven't seen that in my experience. I've seen sub investigators as PAs and NPs. That's all fine and well. But again, if you want to have control of your studies, if you want to be asking the major questions, making the ultimate decisions. And then of course, keep in mind that comes with ultimate liability. You're having the ultimate responsibility for when something goes wrong, if you can accept that, then pursuing a degree as a physician sounds like it would be the most satisfying choice or as a PhD. Um, 
So like just knowing yourself, I did not know myself when I was 18 or 20 or 22, as <laughs> someone else mentioned on the call too, you know, you might not, if you do, then that's great. And again, your, your path will be more ex expedient, but take as long as you need to, to really figure out what your, what is going to satisfy you in a career. And I think that that's the best way to decide what type of program to apply to. To add to that, if I could, um, I would recommend really considering, you know, what your ultimate career goals are and whether you can accomplish those goals with a single degree or whether you absolutely need a dual degree. And once you kind of, you know, tease that apart, you know, you can say like, will the level of a master's degree suffice for what my goals are? Or do I need a PhD to really be at like this extreme excellent level of research? Um, so I think like really considering that and not, you know, pursuing it unless you know that for your ultimate career goals, you need both degrees in order to be successful. Um, yeah. Thank you. Just to add really quickly, this was actually uh, one of my interview questions. So, you know, why not just a master's degree? Why don't you just do a research with your master's degree? Um, I think, you know, Kelly and Danielle, they made a great point. If you want to do an independent research, I think PhD is one of the most efficient ways to go about it and, and to have that credibility at the end. Um, just to move on, we have a question for everyone. I was wondering if you all also spend time during your gap year trying to enhance other parts of your applications, such as clinical experience. If so, could you talk a bit about what type of experiences you partook in? So I don't have an order, but um, just anyone I you can, can jump in. Yeah, yeah. I, I can talk about that a little bit, Jeff. So I was really lucky to be in a lab that had also like a physician fellows so what I did was shadow them um, and it was really nice because it also lined up really beautifully with like the research we were doing. Um, so it was nice to kind of take what I was learning in the lab and then see it in the clinic. So I would definitely um, tell you to like reach out to people that are in your lab or maybe neighboring labs. Like um, I know it's scary, but actually a lot of these like uh, fellows even attending, they're really nice, especially when they know you want to go into um, translational medicine. They really want to take you into the clinic. Um, so that was one thing I did. And also, um, because I was on campus at UCLA, very close to the hospital, um, I was still doing like a little bit of my undergrad work there. So just like, again, staying as connected as I could until they were like, that's it, you graduate, you can't do work anymore. <laughs> um, I was kind of there. So that's one thing I would suggest, at least for me, I was trying to get a lot more clinical experience because that's something that I knew my application was lacking. I guess I could speak on that next. Um, I really tailored my time more for research and like serious pursuit of like publications. Um, of course, publications are not required, but um, I'm really kind of targeting myself towards academia and education. And so for me, that was required. Um, a hot take, I personally don't think that shadowing like hundreds of hours in a gap year or gap two years is very worthwhile. Um, there's a lot of controversy as far as how important shadowing is for any medical student's application, because uh, we all know that if it's not meaningful, like if you're like there as part of research or, uh, you know, clinical studies, things, things like that, you're just sitting there waiting to text whoever is on your phone next. So um, everyone knows that. And so if you have like any desire to just rack up hours, the limit is about like 100 hours. Um, and then after that, no one really cares. So just be mindful of that for like any of the activities you're doing. Um, if it's not meaningful, if it's not something that's cohesive to your story, um, if it's not something that is like directly related to your research or your passions or you figuring out um, if being in a clinic for like 80 hours a week during residency is for you, then it's not something worthwhile. And that's, that's a good way to judge like what your activities should be during that time, in my opinion. I'd like to just add to that a little bit if I could. Um, so I've worked on the MD admission side and the MD PhD, and I think for MD PhD, um, uh, at least from my personal experience, um, I had way too many clinical hours, probably more than I ever needed. I had maybe around 2000 clinical hours. And uh, in comparison, my colleagues that are, are in the, the same cohort as me, they had maybe a maximum of like 40 hours. 
but I think I was kind of a little bit unusual in that sense. And I think part of that comes from me being, you know, kind of navigating this uh, process on my own and uh, as a first gen um, college student. So um, I would definitely say for MD, PhD um, to, um, you know, just understand that research is the most important aspect that they're going to look at. Um, but if you're applying MD and MD, PhD, I think clinical hours can be really valuable. Um, clinical volunteer work, um, working with different communities, uh, you know, within your community. Um, I think in multiple capacities, it can be um, really helpful, maybe not just solely shadowing, but I think that there's other ways that you can, um, you know, get involved and experience what it's like to really work with um, patient populations. Um, and I actually will, I just want to mention um, for anyone that um, is can maybe in between MD and MD PhD, there is a really great resource um, by the AAMC. It's called Using MCAT Data in 2022 Medical St Student Selection. And there's a table on page 15 where admissions um, committees basically rank importance of different experiences and three being the highest of importance and one being the lowest of importance. And I'll drop that link um, here for you guys if you wanna check it out. I think it's really helpful. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Um, next question we have is when asking for recommendations from faculty after a gap year or two, did you feel it was necessary to meet with them in person and update them on what you've done? Also, was it difficult for you to decide on who to ask? I think it's important to try to maintain a relationship with people that you think you're you're going to want to ask a favor from. Um, it depends on if you are staying at the same place and you have access to them in person. I think it's a great idea to meet with them in person and just catch up with them. And um, it kind of leaves a little better impression. I moved out of state after college, um, but I did try to maintain that relationship. And I, when I emailed them, and I still do it when I when I'm applying for grants and if I need any letter of rec from anyone I used to work with, I will include a paragraph um, reminding them of the context of which they knew me, and then anything I wanted them to remember about me um, in the first paragraph. So I'd be like, I took your, you know, I was your student during this year. I took your class and did great or something and then um, and did this with you. So just to just so that they know who you are, they remember. And then um, I would always include what you want them to include in the letter as well um, to just kind of help them out. And then I always attach a CV so that they can pick and choose what they want to include. Yeah, I agree. I think Cynthia, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, they're so busy. A lot, of, a lot of them get many of these requests and just taking the initiative to proactively attach your CV and, and write up a little bit about yourself to refresh their memory saves them a lot of time. And, um, you know, even if they would be gung ho to write you a letter of recommendation from scratch, this will just really save them a lot of time. Uh, just want to chime in. Also, I applied during the pandemic when the pandemic was happening. So last cycle. So I um, what I did was I uh, I talked to them for like an hour on Zoom and that kind of helped us just kind of get past the emails. Um, I also did send my CV there, like Cynthia said, that was very helpful. They appreciated that. And then you can talk to them quickly for an hour, kind of tell them where you're applying. And then that kind of gives them an idea of what they also should write to help you um, to help you with getting the best letter. Um, and then I want to chime in on the question about like having difficulty uh, choosing who to ask. What I ended up doing, because I was I was also like I was a little uncertain about that. But what I ended up doing was asking um, just like the pre health advisors from my undergrad institution who I had tried to stay in contact with during my gap years. But I asked them. I said, okay, if I have like um, a letter from my undergrad research mentor, my current research mentor, my prep director, like is there is there anything else that you would recommend or does that seem like unbalanced? And so they were able to um, kind of give me advice. So I think what I ended up having was my undergrad research mentor, my prep director, 
my research mentor during prep and then one of my um, college professors who I had taken multiple courses with, um, but that was based on their recommendation. So we have a question on committee letters. So uh, maybe someone, uh, maybe one of the panelists could explain what a committee letter is um, and how that works. And uh, yeah, anyone could chime in on that. Um, I can talk about the committee letter. So basically what a committee letter is, is that many undergrad institutions when you're applying to medical school, will um, rather than you filling out an application and then your AMCAS application, and then um, having individual recommenders submit their letters, they'll do um, like a letter on behalf of the, the school. And so you would have, um, so like Columbia, where I went to undergrad has a pretty like established pipeline for the committee letter. They send, they have like the same timeline every year, they make you submit basically everything that you're gonna put into your AMCAS, you submit it to them, you have your recommenders submit letters to them, and then they kind of um, write a letter on behalf of your of you and your recommenders, and they kind of summarize you as a student. And they also, um, a lot of schools will say, we recommend this applicant very highly. We recommend them like moderately. We don't recommend them. I mean, they'll probably, uh, like they would tell you if, if they don't think you're ready to apply. But um, so that's basically what the committee letter is. I, I felt like I, my pre-health advisors, I was like kind of wary about having them write a letter on my behalf because I was like, I don't really like know them that well. I graduated two years ago. Um, but then my prep director said that if your school offers a committee letter and you don't, um, you don't opt to, to do the committee letter, then it would seem kind of like it would kind of raise a red flag. So I decided to do it, but I ended up being really glad that I did because the it ended up being like a, a really involved process. And I interviewed with the committee that was writing the letter. And I really felt like they got to know me in that, you know, few months span that they were working on my letter. Thank you. Um, just, to add, just to add my uh, two cents on the previous question, um, you could always ask the faculty of a letter. You don't have to ask them right before you apply. You can always ask them early on and send and ask them to send it to interfolio.com. So it will be stored on that site. And then you can use that letter whenever you want to. And just make sure you ask them if they could write you a strong letter of recommendation. Um, anyways, next question to all the panelists who have been on admission committees how much does a competitive GPA matter? Um, so I can talk a little bit about this. Um, so I think at least I can only speak for um, my university, the University of Arizona Tucson. Um, I think in general, uh, the way that we review applications is incredibly holistic and I'm so like happy to be at this institution. And um, I think that once you're beyond a certain, you know, GPA, it doesn't really matter as much. It's only a small portion of, um, you know, your application. And I think the big thing that, you know, the GPA and the MCAT, that's what all pre-med students stress about, but that really only tells us, um, you know, on, from an admissions perspective, it tells us, are you likely to pass your board exam, step one, step two? And it tells us, are you likely to do well in your classes? Are you gonna, you know, are you likely to fail, you know, majority of your tests? Are you gonna fail out of school? Or are you probably gonna be okay? And I think beyond those two questions, it, it really doesn't tell you, you know, the quality of the physician that you're gonna be, how caring you are, all of those other incredibly important aspects. In my opinion, they're maybe even a little bit more important than the grades. So um, I think it just depends on the institution though. Um, for our committee at Mount Sinai, I would say that we hardly ever um, talk about the GPA. It's kind of just like above a certain GPA, it 
it doesn't matter. We're not going to say like, oh, well, this person had a 3.9 and this person had a 3.7. So like, obviously we want the 3.9. Like we, we don't get into the weeds of it that much. Um, but I also want to share that my undergrad GPA was like on the lower side. So I had a 3.14 um, and I was still able to get into an MD PhD program and I'm thriving. So I hope that that encourages someone. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> uh, I think for the sake of time, I think that will be the last question for today. So, you know, thank you everyone for joining the Q&A session. Um, I want to thank the panelists for their time, uh, the participants who made this session very interactive. And so, and so many people, including the APSA Diversity Ad Hoc Committee, the PR, the Partnerships Committees, Gabby and APSA Leadership that not only put these sessions together, uh, but also worked to make sure that the, uh, the UIM applicants received word of it as well. We are currently in the process of planning our calendar for the upcoming interactive sessions next year. So stay tuned uh, by social media and look out for emails. So thank you everyone for joining us today. <laughs>